our front yard had no trees. Around back, there was a great big cottonwood tree. But my father had planted that when he was a kid. And so that was doing well. But in front, there was nothing, along with almost all of eastern South Dakota. There are no trees. <laughs> But he bought a piece of property a couple blocks away so that he could have even a bigger garden. And on that property, there was a tree there. It was pretty big, but it was divided right at the base of the tree. And he said, we're going to go take that tree out today. So I went with him, and he dug around, and he, then he sawed the tree right down the middle so that there would be two trees. And he had dug some holes in the front of the house. You know, it was uh, perfectly symmetrical, two trees in front of the house. And he chopped off all the branches. And I was so embarrassed for a year because we had these two big posts. There were no branches there. It was just like you should hang some telephone wires around them. And what are we doing? Well, today we heard about the stump of Jesse. Jesse is King David's father. King David, the great king, the anointed one of God. And he is the one, now there is this line of kings, and most of them are bad. Some of them are absolutely horrible. And the prophet comes to the king and to the nation and says, the axe is at the base of the tree, and that this corruption is going to be cut down. It's going to be a stump, but also gives the good news that from that stump, like from these two big stumps in front of our house, a branch will come forth. New life will come forth. And so it was with our trees in front of our house. They're, they're still there to this day, I think. I haven't been back in a few years. But there they are, and they are big, beautiful locust trees. And life was there in that stump. We just heard some shocking and amazing news. Isaiah says that there will be a stump that come, a branch that comes forth from this tree of the royal house of Jerusalem, that they will be chopped down. And indeed, it was some time later. It will be chopped down, but a new branch will grow from that, from those roots. So it's bad news for the royal house that this is going to be chopped down. But it's good news for the people that there will come a day where there is going to be righteousness and justice and equality there for the nation. He will bring faithful, just, and strong leadership once again. The good news will not be just for Jerusalem, though, but the prophet said this good news will spread to all the ends of the earth and to all of creation. And we heard those amazing things about the lion lying down with the lamb and the little child is playing over the, the den of the snakes and the snakes don't bite them. It's this vision of where all things will be made right. And John the Baptizer is in line as the last of the Old Testament prophets and now the first of the followers of Jesus announcing his way and saying, prepare. Well, he comes in with a, a wild story. He's wearing wild clothes. He's eating wild food. And he's a wild guy. I imagine his hair is going out all over the place. He had given up on everything. He had given up on the government. He had given up on the temple. He had given up on the Pharisees and all of the religious leaders. And he went out into the desert to start a little commune, commune so that he wouldn't be affected by all of that. He just gave up on it. And now he comes into the River Jordan and he announces this wild message. 
He says, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. His message was bad news for the current political establishment and the current religious establishment. And he sees the Sadducees and the Pharisees representing all of that, and he calls them, you brood of snakes, you brood of vipers. So it's bad news for those who are in authority because they're only interested in doing things their own way and having it the way it's always been, even though it hasn't always been that way. It hadn't always had Romans directing everything in the temple and Romans directing everything in the society. And he says, you think you're going to trust in your genealogy? That's not going to work. Your nationality? Some of you think that you can just like correct your behavior or you're the ones pointing fingers at everybody else who's not behaving like you want them to do and that you are going to make bring in the kingdom of God that way. It's not going to work. So when we hear the message of the prophets, of John the Baptist, and also of Jesus, you know, he spoke some tough words as well to these same Pharisees and Sadducees. He said, you're just whitewashed tombs. It's all dead. There's nothing living there. But it's a good news, bad news story for us as well. It's very bad news if we are depending only on our traditions, on our ancestry, in order to justify ourselves. But John's message, Isaiah's message, the message of Jesus is good news for all of us because we have heard, received, and made it part of ourselves inside that we have found this amazing grace and mercy in Jesus Christ. And that is what transforms people's lives. It's not more rules. It's not, you know, looking back and see what nationality we come from. The good news of Jesus Christ is completely apart from skin color or denomination, from religion and tradition, from gender or sexuality or marital status or the language that we speak or our economic status, or from any educational degree or lack thereof. John says that all those things are the chaff that will be burned with unquenchable fire. Those things do not last. And yet we still want to cling on to those things, that chaff. The good news for us is we, only, we know what the wheat is. We know what the, the good news is, that this faith, this hope, and this love that comes to us most clearly in Jesus Christ, in his death and resurrection, that that, and along with us, as that wheat is planted within our hearts and souls and minds and bodies, that that will be stored in the granary forever. So the good news, bad news story is important for us as Christmas is coming. It's important to know what is the wheat and what is the chaff as we struggle to understand what's going on in the world as wars rage in Afghanistan and Iraq and in Yemen, wondering if these will ever end. Christmas is coming, but drugs are destroying people's lives one after another. Christmas is coming, but there are shootings, murders in our schools, in our homes, in our houses of worship, in our theaters and clubs. 
and stores and military bases. This week, one of our four-year-olds in our preschool was killed. Murdered. And the teacher, as we met together, Barbara and the teachers, the head of the school said, you know, I taught in the Bronx for all of these years, and nothing like this ever happened, and here it is in Pleasantville. It's not just someplace else. Sometimes we're tempted to believe that. The world wants us to cover up the reality of our lives and our world with a lot of tinsel and flashing lights so that we can carry on trusting in the chaff that will do us no good. The Advent message, though, doesn't allow us. Isaiah doesn't allow it. John the Baptist doesn't allow it. And Jesus does not allow it. Christ is calling us to repent. Now, I know that's a bad word. But he is calling us to repent from trusting in that ex extraneous stuff, that incidental stuff. To repent from trusting in that and to go a different direction, look to a different source, change of heart and mind that looks to the wheat, that looks to Jesus. It calls us to renounce the chaff that is our power and our privilege and our prosperity as our gods and look to Christ Jesus alone. And we need to encourage one another in repentance. Look to God. Look to Christ Jesus. And I hope that the confession today empowers you to understand that you have those powers and the keys as well to declare the entire forgiveness of your sin, of your sin, of your sin. And to encourage one another in that repentance. Because when we see that we're turning to something even better than what we already have, this is good news. Repentance is therefore good news when we're looking to that light and that love and that hope that endures forever. So Christian hope and faith is not some airy, sugary, flashy fantasy. It is that we should be repenting. Repenting of that chaff and turning toward that grain. We're always wanting to have things stay the way they are because there's some certainty in that in this world that is changing so rapidly. And that is not to say that the great traditions of the gospel are to ever be changed, but they can be understood and presented and and shared in new ways, as the new times call us to do. But God is offering another way from just those things in which we trust in ourselves. And that is more powerful than the fears that we have. It's the way that claims justice and not revenge. It's the way that claims forgiveness as the greater power than sin. It is the way that claims that life will overcome death. So today, not because of we have some utopian fantasy of everything is going to be made right tomorrow, but we are the body of the resurrected Christ. And so today, we repent. We repent 
of fear and plain faith. We repent of despair and claim hope. We repent of hate and choose to love. Even as the darkness is great, we light the candles of light in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.